Larry Riskin joined the Navy after school and over the years of service, he achieved the rank of commanding officer in the Navy fleet. He participated in the Persian Gulf War and demonstrated courage and bravery multiple times, but unexpectedly discovered that he was taking orders from a fragile woman. Larry met Sonia Rios at a barbecue. She owned a beauty salon in the city of Lamita, a suburb of Los Angeles. He was immediately attracted to the very beautiful and striking woman, and within a year, Sonia took her husband's family name and became Sonia Riskin. They settled in Sonia's house. Larry was always extremely close to his family, parents, brothers, and especially his younger sister Sherry Jackson. But everything changed with the arrival of Sonia. She did not allow him to see his relatives, inventing various reasons why they couldn't visit them in Washington. The relationship deteriorated to the point that Larry didn't communicate with his sister and brothers for over 10 years. They only heard rumors that he had resigned and found a job as a teacher for children with special needs. His colleagues remember that he loved children and adored his job. However, he confessed that he was unhappy at home. One thing weighed heavily on him. He dreamed of becoming a father. However, Sonia did not want to have children, and being a very beautiful woman, she misled Larry, pretending to be younger than him. In reality, she was 16 years older. Of course, women at that age are still capable of having children. But Larry felt that his chances of fulfilling his dream were diminishing with each passing day. That's why he grasped at the last straw. In Sonia's homeland, the Philippines, he became attached to his wife's brother's grandchildren, Quincy and Jetmark. The parents of the teenagers believed that with Sonia and Larry in the USA, their children would have a better future, so they supported Larry's proposal to adopt them. Sonia did not object, but insisted on taking care of all the legal matters herself. A year passed, two, three, but the process of adoption was not progressing. Larry discovered that Sonia was intentionally sabotaging the adoption process. At that moment, it was his last chance to create a complete family, and he was very disappointed. So much so that he demanded a divorce. Sonia agreed, but with one condition. She asked her husband to go to the Philippines and sell her family business, a taxi company, a matter that needed to be resolved immediately. The man agreed, partly because he wanted to see the children, especially since Quincy's 16th birthday was approaching. Surprisingly, Sonia did not go, even though the matter concerned her family and her business. Before his visit to the Philippines, the first in 13 years, Larry visited his relatives in Washington. He was happy to start a new chapter in his life without his wife but with her nephews, whom he still hoped to adopt. Immediately after landing, Larry went to see them. During the birthday party, Larry noticed that the little cousin of the boys had developed an eye infection. He insisted on taking her to the hospital. Someone present made a call to Sonia, and informed her that they would be at the hospital. Larry put the girl in the car and, along with Jetmark and a few other adults, they all went to the hospital. After the visit to the doctor, they got back into the jeep and were about to return home when a motorcycle approached them. One of the two men on the motorcycle started shooting at Larry's head and abdomen. Then the criminals quickly fled the scene. Jetmark tried to help Larry, and called for help. He was confident that they would save him since the hospital was only a few steps away. But the boy was mistaken. They couldn't save Larry. He was 43 years old. When Sonia was informed of her husband's murder, she completely lost control. She was shaking all over and needed help from neighbors Nicole and Jim Thompson to calm her down. Nicole called Larry's sister, Sherry, to inform her about what had happened, but unexpectedly, Sherry started blaming Sonia for everything. Nicole and Jim didn't take her words seriously. Not then. However, the next morning, Sonia asked Jim again to come and help her search for documents. When Jim learned that Sonia was looking for her husband's insurance policy, he refused to help her. While Larry's family was preparing for his funeral, his wife was only interested in the insurance. Moreover, Sonia had no intention of attending the funeral. 
she arranged for her husband to be cremated, and the urn with his ashes remained in the Philippines with one of her relatives. Larry's relatives saw this as another blow from Sonia, but they still held the funeral and prepared a niche in the mausoleum, where they hoped to someday place the urn with his ashes. They hoped that the Philippine police would solve this case, confident that Larry's wife was behind it all. But at that time, they still didn't know, nor could they have known, that there was another mystery in this story, another man, and another murder. It was news that had the impact of a bomb exploding. Larry Riskin was not Sonia's first husband. And the reason why they were no longer together with her first husband was that he was killed in the Philippines 19 years ago. The man's name was Earl John Bordeaux. Earl's family lived in Davenport, Iowa, in the same house where he grew up. He was the pride of the family. Earl joined the Navy during the Vietnam War, but his unit was stationed in the Philippines, where he met an attractive local girl named Sonia, who sang at a nightclub near their base. It was obviously love at first sight because the young couple quickly got married, and a few months later, Earl brought his young wife home to meet his family. However, the happy reunion did not go well. The girl did not please Earl's family. Therefore, after his departure from the Navy, they settled in Southern California. Several years later, Sonia opened a beauty salon, and her husband found work in a bakery. Outwardly, it seemed like a family filled with love and harmony. But in reality, Sonia enjoyed giving orders to her military husband and controlled him as she pleased. They lived together for more than 20 years when Earl finally realized that such a family life and his wife's commands were burdening him. Sonia agreed to divorce. But before that, and here a strange sense of deja vu arose, the husband needed to go to the Philippines to sell the family taxi motor company. Earl didn't want to go, but his wife was inflexible on this issue, and the man chose not to argue. He pleaded with his younger brother Dennis to go with him, but he couldn't quickly obtain a passport, so Earl went to the Philippines alone. It was a hot August night when Earl's plane landed in Manila. He arrived at the house where his wife's relatives lived around midnight. The man was exhausted from the journey, fell onto the couch, and fell into a deep sleep, until he was truly killed. When the police arrived, they found Earl lying in a pool of his own blood. He had been shot. The officers concluded that a robber had entered the house, and Earl had interfered, but there were no signs of forced entry, nothing was stolen, and the criminal only fired at Earl. Three men were immediately arrested and charged with the murder. Later, two more were detained. They were all members of Sonia's family. Fresh human blood was found on the shirt and pants of one of Sonia's brothers. There was enough evidence to send the culprits to prison for a long time. But then came a surprise. Since Sonia was the closest relative, according to Philippine law, she was supposed to attend a preliminary hearing in court where charges would be brought against her family members. However, since she didn't show up, the charges were dropped, and the case was closed. The local authorities claimed their hands were tied. At least officially. Unofficially, the locals gossip that Sonia paid to make all the problems go away. As they explain it, a thousand dollars, and the witnesses would stay silent, and the evidence would disappear. Earl's brother, Dennis, felt guilty because he let his brother go alone, so he constantly called a lawyer in the Philippines, spending thousands of dollars on his own investigation, hoping to make Sonia worried. But instead, he became the target himself. He received around 200 threats over the phone, but he didn't calm down. He reported Sonia to the police and the FBI. As a result, he became the target of the killer. It happened once while he was fishing. The shooter missed, but it didn't end there. Later, the attack happened right near his garage. Dennis informed the FBI about everything, but nothing happened. The Bordeaux case was forgotten until, after 10 years, Dennis learned that Sonia had a second husband, and he suffered the same fate as his brother. Dennis hoped that the renewed interest in Sonia could also revive interest in his brother's case. Once earning Sonia's plans to obtain not only all the property but also her husband's insurance, 
things didn't go as planned. The insurance company hired a private investigator who quickly discovered that fraud was nothing new for Sonia. She had burned down her beauty salon for insurance purposes, manipulated taxes and receipts. She had been caught twice before, so her name was known to the police. The investigator provided his report to the employer, and the insurance company refused to pay Sonia the insurance money. However, the investigator's work impressed Sherry and her family so much that they hired him to investigate the murders. He quickly found out that Earl's and Larry's murders were similar in that the Sony brothers were involved in both crimes. They, like other family members, were financially dependent on Sonia and were willing to do anything she demanded. Sherry, just like Dennis, handed everything the private investigator found to the FBI, hoping that an investigation would finally begin. However, weeks and months passed, and nothing changed. Sonia continued working at her salon as usual. But after the new year, Sherry started receiving emails. The author claimed that Sonia was responsible for Larry's murder and offered to return his sister's ashes. The emails were signed by John Bordeaux. How could that be? Bordeaux was the surname of Sonia's first husband, but Earl John Bordeaux had long been dead. It turns out that Sonia had a son whose existence she kept secret. She gave birth to a boy in the Philippines when she was a very young girl, a teenager. Earl adopted the boy after their wedding. Earl's family knew nothing about him, nor did Larry's family, despite Larry's desperate desire to have children. Nevertheless, Sherry decided to respond to the emails, primarily because she wanted to return Larry's ashes. John asked for $35,000 in return. But the more they corresponded, the more Sherry became afraid of what kind of person he might be. What if he was a fraud or something worse? With each new letter, she realized that he was indeed worse. For an additional fee, he offered another service, to kill Sonia, whom Sherry despised. Sherry was frightened, not knowing how to escape this situation and fearing what else might happen. Her fears were not unfounded. On April 27, 2007, in Lamita, the 60-year-old owner of a beauty salon was found murdered. She had been shot, and the killing resembled an execution rather than a random shooting. The victim was Sonia Riskin, known as the Black Widow of Lamita, who was suspected of killing not one, but two husbands. She met the same fate as her victims. The arriving police were struck by the meticulous and well-kept nature of the house. It appeared that the owner rarely received visitors during her lifetime, which perfectly matched her character as a reclusive and suspicious woman. It was also interesting to note that there were no signs of forced entry. It seemed that the killer simply entered the house and shot his victim. Her purse remained untouched, along with the cash inside. The neighbors saw nothing. The victim's relatives immediately rushed to the scene, among them her beloved nephew, Eric de la Cruz. Sonia regarded him as her favorite grandson and was proud of him. The young man served on the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier and had just returned home after a tour of Asia. Upon hearing that his beloved aunt had been killed, he immediately informed the police that if something happened to Sonia, John Bordeaux was responsible for it all. John Bordeaux didn't have to be searched for, as he was the one who found Sonia's body and contacted the rescue service. The detectives immediately found the relationship between the son and mother strange. There wasn't a single photograph of him in the house, no hint of a son, as if he didn't exist for Sonia. Overall, he seemed like the family outcast, especially compared to Sonia's favorite, Eric. John explained that although he and his mother sometimes couldn't find common ground and didn't communicate, the situation had improved recently, and he would never harm her. When asked who he believed could have committed the murder, he could only mention Sherry, Larry's sister. After all, she genuinely hated Sonia. As did Dennis. The FBI questioned both of them, but they had alibis. Moreover, no one was as devastated by Sonia's death as these two. They hoped Sonia would pay for her terrible actions by going to prison. So the detectives turned their attention back to John. 
the electronic emails signed with his name didn't work in his favor. Furthermore, he failed the polygraph test. Even his own relatives considered him the murderer. Allegedly, no one else had the motive, opportunity, and means to commit the crime, but he insisted on his innocence, and stood his ground. Therefore, the detectives didn't rush to arrest him, and they were rewarded with a clue from the Black Widow herself. A few days before Sonia's death, she contacted the police to report two strange incidents at her beauty salon. The first time, a young man appeared at her hairdressing salon, wanting a haircut. He called her from the parking lot, and Sonia saw him through the window. She became suspicious because he had a short, military-style haircut. It was clear he didn't need a haircut, so she told him that she only served regular clients, which he wasn't. It seemed like the incident was resolved, but two days later, the same guy returned to the salon and this time acted more aggressively. He opened fire on Sonia, causing her to panic and call the police. She informed the officers that she didn't know the shooter, but she remembered he had called her two days ago. The cautious woman recorded his number. It belonged to a certain Fernando Romero. Romero himself had disappeared, but the detectives only needed a warrant to access the history of his calls. They expected the phone to lead them to John Bordeaux, but no, his number wasn't listed. Instead, they found the number of someone they knew well. A person who had communicated with Fernando not once or twice, but frequently, especially in the hours before and after the murder. The number belonged to Sonia's beloved nephew, Eric de la Cruz. Further on, after a week, the news reached the FBI. Specialists were investigating the IP addresses, from which the supposed letters from John Bordeaux were sent. All of them led to Asia, Hong Kong, Korea. These addresses belonged to naval bases. The FBI employees knew that Eric and Romero were two sailors who served on an aircraft carrier. It was likely that they knew each other. Could these young individuals have planned the murder while being on an American military ship? The FBI investigated the location of the ship during the time the emails were sent. It was in ports in Hong Kong, Japan, and South Korea at the same time the letters were sent. However, sending letters is one thing, but why would Eric kill a woman who cared for him better than his own son? Sonia was killed late in the evening on Friday. And on Monday morning, even before the office opened, Eric was already waiting for her lawyer. He wanted to know how much money he would inherit from his beloved aunt. However, Sonia had another card hidden up her sleeve. Eric didn't receive a cent. All her money, homes, cars, absolutely all of Sonia's belongings were left to her son, Jean Bordeaux. But the young man had another harsh blow awaiting him. It turned out that all this time, while he believed he was the main suspect of the police, Jean Bordeaux was being misled. And when the investigators simply presented him with a photograph of Fernando Romero, Eric lost his ability to speak. Choking on surprise and stumbling over his words, he blurted out that he had conducted his own investigation, and Fernando had nothing to do with it. He must have realized that Fernando was the thread leading the investigation back to himself. Both young individuals were arrested and charged with the murder of Sonia Riskin. The police apologized to John for pressuring him. He was still frightened after what he had to endure, but he understood that the detectives were just doing their job. In February 2011, the trial began. Fernando and Eric were tried together. The prosecution faced a difficult task. The victim of the murder herself was suspected of orchestrating the killings of two husbands. The accused, the young sailors, could elicit sympathy in comparison. The prosecutor decided to be honest with the jury. He portrayed her as a cold-blooded killer deserving punishment, but now it was necessary to punish the defendants who not only killed a woman but also attempted to frame her son. It worked. The jury found the two guilty. They were sentenced to imprisonment ranging from 26 years to life. It was an astonishing family, they eliminated anyone in their path for financial gain. Sonia and her brothers killed Earl. 
Sonia and her brothers killed Larry. And Eric killed his beloved aunt. How many murders can there be in one family if it's not a Game of Thrones? The irony lies in the fact that Sonya killed two people who did nothing wrong and were always kind to her. Eric killed a person who had always been kind to him for the sake of money he never received. The Black Widow of Lamata truly reaped what she sowed. In 2019, Sherry went to the Philippines to personally try to find Larry's remains. She could only ascertain that the remains were passed from one relative to another under Eric's orders. In the end, her search led her to a house that had obviously been vacant for a long time. She couldn't fulfill her dream of returning with her brother's urn to their homeland. <laughs>